As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're here again with our off-grid doctor, Jay Nielsen, MD. He is the founder of Safely Home and a Christian mission in Haiti, his Haiti hideaway, where he has not only built a compound capable of sustainably supporting dozens of families, but also improving the condi- life conditions and opportunities for the surrounding community. And we're going to probe deeper tonight with him than we ever had an opportunity to in the past about the analysis that he personally went through, his personal journey to creating the vision that became Safely Home, and walk us through the considerations that were on his mind and that we can consider when planning a safe place for our family should things fall apart. So welcome back, Dr. Nielsen. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be back. I'm enjoying all of this. We're so glad to have you on Reluctant Preppers. And you really piqued some interest last time when you described the really uncommon level of preparedness that you've reached, that a lot of our listeners are doing what they can, starting to take first steps to help improve the preparedness of their families. But you've gone much farther than most folks, really. A lot of people are living in either urban or suburban environments, and they have what seem to be very limited options around them for sustainably um, supporting their family's life needs. Uh, They're so dependent upon municipal water, uh, electricity, and uh, you know commercial food supplies and that sort of thing that if those became unavailable uh, they would have very few options to turn to other than a a limited cash of immediate to meet their immediate needs but uh, if you could just give us an understanding of where where did you start from in this process for yourself and what were the questions you asked yourself what the problem it was you were trying to solve and how you approached it Well, I actually approached it backwards because I had the need to be able to work in Haiti and I needed to be able to not haul things in and out. And of course, I've now sent 10 40-foot shipping containers to Haiti in preparation for this project. Um, And it wasn't until I'd been working for about two years to make the compound that I realized that it was safely home and it is where I wanted to be and that... I needed to retool for permanent independence, not short-term living. That completely changed my viewpoint. And that's when I really sat down and said, what are all of the enumerated requirements of a getaway? And what are the benefits and the detriments of every solution we can come up with? And just before you did that, I mean, that's an uncommon exercise for most folks to take. So what were the, what, just if you could just for a minute, just give us some of the, the signs of the times or whatever that led you to go down such a uh, unconventional way of thinking. Gee, this week's been a good one with a 20% jump in silver in one day and Ferguson and a national budget that's $1.3 trillion with $0.34 trillion in revenues. Um <laughs> I, I hope next week looks better because this wasn't a good week for me. This was this made me put one giant step out of here. Okay, so you were paying attention to the unsustainable trends in the world around us and saying this can't go on forever. This is not. It can't end, go on. This doesn't end well. This doesn't end well. Okay. No one's asking the right questions and no big decisions are being made. In the face of that, you decided to start making some decisions for yourself. So Correct. if you could start, I would be really curious for our viewers to hear from you whether it was sort of a grand vision that then pulled the details out of you or if you started taking some detailed analyses and that led you to this big vision no it was it was a grand decision to create jobs in haiti for the men and women who live around me and i realized that as i built that infrastructure with a hotel conference center farms drip irrigation manufacturing that it was a a lot of people have said i'm building a city when they visit it And it made me realize that I was just a few short steps away from independence. And that what I really need to pay attention to was non-renewable supplies. And when you did that analysis, what drew your attention? Where did you first realize the most critical needs were that you were going to have to address? Oh, number one is water. I don't care where we are. Uh, You know, Maslow's hierarchy is simple. Air, and if you have a bunker, 
air is number one. And then number two is water, number three is four is food, and number four is shelter. Right? This is easy. Maslow's hierarchy is very accurate. You can't talk to a man about any emotional needs until you've achieved those four things. So where did you, can you walk us through sort of in a, in a orderly manner, sort of the first, second, and third problems that you went to solve then in, in that analysis? Well, of course, I was blessed by the gift of many, many, many solar panels, 300. I won a, world, I won a worldwide competition with a solar manufacturing company, and they gave me 300 panels. I know a lot of people who would be very glad if that happened to them. Yeah, well, <laughs> try mission work. People are more generous. And the very first thing that I did was I drilled a 200-foot well into the purest water in the Caribbean islands and, and got this incredible water that is just absolutely perfect and requires no filtration, which made me realize that all I need is 34 solar panels and I own an ice house. And I went, there's one job. There's one factory. And that's how you think. You go, okay, I got water, I got electricity. What can you do with water and electricity? Well, you can refrigerate it. So that kind of think, that kind of thought process, that synergistic, creative thought process that doesn't just look at what is, but looks at what's possible by combining things, where the sum of the parts really is greater. Combining than the is the world. Combining is my world. How, lots of times I get a project and one of my partners walks up and says, why don't you do this with that? I just had my entire world rocked by a guy who studies permaculture. I couldn't spell permaculture. And he spent four years traveling the world studying it. And on my last trip, he completely changed my entire vision of my farm. And I'm starting over. But I'm starting over for the better because he made it biologically self-healing. I was going to fight to keep weeds out of my garden. I was going to fight to keep water on things. And he went, you're working uphill. Turn around and slide down this process, and there's a natural solution. Mm -hmm. And he's absolutely right. If you get the right consultants, you get the right answers. Well, that's an interesting thing, how creativity tends to draw like-minded individuals to itself. I remember uh, as, a, as a child, uh, Walt Disney was a, was a idol of mine, and, and he tended to draw people who could... Imagineer and could invent whatever was possible that they could bring to you know together their their forces combined and uh, so you started on this sort of like Don Quixote it seems like but your your initial vision though was to be in collaboration with in partnership with uh, local people certainly to help them uh, have opportunities they wouldn't otherwise have had well I think that's point number one if you're looking at the day that you have to bolt from your current environment. And you have to travel some distance to some place you feel is remote enough to be safe. Okay, what makes you safe isn't fences, it isn't walls, it isn't my my five sixteenths inch thick steel on the containers. It's the fact that when you start coming up the road five miles away from me to uh, to come into my community before you arrive, Lorgans and Shariban will be saying, "There's a Blanc coming up the road." And I'm going to know you're coming without any alarms, using good old hands and feet, and let's run for it and beat the guy to the target. And so they're going to allow that person to come to me while they watch to see how that transpires. At any time when I give them a signal I'm uncomfortable, they're going to very rapidly surround me and protect me. To do that, they have to be my employees, they have to be my friends, and they have to see my future. And if they share that future, then I don't need security. Whereas if you're in a bunker, you're six inches of concrete away from getting blasted out of your hole. Okay, And that was when I finally realized that I, I really had a good place to go and that I needed to simply mature it. Now, in your write-up of this that we'll share with our viewers, you also uh, laid out a fairly analytical comparison, sort of a pros and cons ranking of different aspects. You just mentioned a uh, drawback of a bunker versus being in a uh, cooperative community relationship, really. Correct. And well, what were the what were the options, the plans A, B, and C that, that you looked at? Well, the basic the basic options that you have are that a lot of people are in the bomb shelter bunker mentality. I'm going to find some place to dig in and hide. I was offered to join one of those a couple years ago. Um, and 
they're expensive to build and of course you're very restricted in your movement and, and et cetera. And we can talk about the deficits. One of your options is to simply go into the basement of your own home and, and try and survive. And admittedly, if you could burn your house down but save the, top, the bottom floor, you might be better off in a house that's burnt out than one that's intact because people may not explore it as much, right? Um, but when you look at all of those options, those people are all living in the ground without sunlight. I'm going to be walking around in my community, going to church, talking to my friends, you know, drinking juices, weeding in my garden and, and watching the sunset. I'm going to be living the day that I live every time I go down to my compound, except for I'm just not planning on coming back after the mission trip. So that's one incredibly important uh facet to consider of your option is what's your quality of life going to be like while you're in that situation? Yeah, I talk to a lot of people who have good friends in Costa Rica and they're buying farmland up in the mountains and they're doing modified forms of this. I don't think they're paying enough attention to drip irrigation, water storage, electrical supply and farming. Um, they think they'll be able to go there and live like they live today and it will be safe. I think the world food supply could be very jeopardized. And if you analyze the food supply in the Caribbean or most of the third world, a lot of it's imported. Hmm. Now, a lot of it is not imported and will rebound when you don't have the U.S. government and other people meddling with the affairs of third world countries. They'll go back to their natural economy. But there are 10 and a half million people in Haiti. There won't be 10 and a half million people five years after the things fall apart. There will be starvation. And you have to figure out how you get through that era. Yes. It's a bleak, bleak concept. And a lot's been written on it. Paul Ehrlich, Population Bomb. Goes all the way back to the historical text, the book that changed my life. So of those options, you're starting to lay out some of the things you considered about the dynamic differences between a bunker preparations versus trying to adapt your existing home, your existing dwelling, versus coming up with a hideaway or getaway location that's completely apart from our typical modern world. Right. So what were the aspects of each of those that you... Well, the important were... aspect to the Safely Home Project for me is I have to be able to get there. And if things fall apart, American Airlines is going to quit flying. Uh, you know, I've seen American Airlines quit flying to Haiti because of a war there one time in 2004. Um, another time because the cholera was starting after the UN brought it in. Um, you know, it's not hard to get transportation down. But then we put together a private charter and found out it was no more expensive than taking in American Airlines, and we didn't have the limited luggage. And so for the same cost as flying in on American or Spirit, uh, you know, I can take in a private charter that's got twice as many seats as I need and throw bags in. Now, I still have to pass through customs. I still got all my bags have got to be legal, but that's okay. You know, I have what I need down there. Um, that's the big disadvantage of the distant place, the biggest drawback, the place where I get to see and going in your basement at home gets an A and your bunker gets a B. Oh, this is your A, B, C yeah, ranking my, system. My ranking so system. So you did this, for, you gave a weighted scores for each of these options in right. each of these categories. So the first category is accessibility. How do you get there? How do you get there? You know, that's a, that's a big key, you know. Um, the second thing that I think is important is defensibility. And um, clearly your basement is not as defensible because you've got to come out and now you're not you're outside your defenses um, a bunker obviously is designed more not to come out and um, and I don't have that defensibility problem nobody's gonna come nobody wants to come to Haiti and take it over they know darn well it's worth nothing and people would be amazed at how beautiful and luxuriant and vibrant the community I work in now Port-au-Prince eh, I mean it's a terrible place it's also six hours away from me and it'll, when, when gasoline disappears, it'll be two days away from me or more. It's 140 miles. I'll virtually be in my own country by that point in time because transportation will drop off. And that's the key. Mobility is what makes things, you know, less defensible. Um, you know, the other thing is my entire compound's made out of 40-foot shipping containers. I have sheer 12-foot walls. And then you have to climb over a tin aluminum roof that makes more noise than you can believe and when you get done 
I know you're there long before you got there, you know. And so, you know, I built the entire compound for security for my team. But today I realize it's a very defensible platform. And when you uh, considered, you mentioned earlier the quality of lifestyle already um, and how you you had planned to be able to attain not only an interesting lifestyle, but a healthy, healthful lifestyle, a rich sure. lifestyle. I feel time. better when I'm down there. I'm not eating GMO food. I'm getting sunlight. I'm exercising. You know, I came back. I spent three of the last five weeks there because we just finished a compound and got all the lights on and the power and the water and hot and cold running water and the showers and the toilets are all flushing, septic systems all in, and, you know, all the gates are up. And So I worked hard for three weeks. And, uh, you know, I came home feeling the best I've felt in 20 years. Uh, the food's cleaner there. It's all locally grown. A lot of it is very, very primitive food that, you know, the potatoes we eat were probably made from the eyes of potatoes that were made from the eyes of potatoes of a man in our community 100 years ago. There's not an awful lot of horticultural pressure from the outside. A lot of our stuff is very primitive, and that's where good health comes from. You also mentioned uh, in your analysis uh, the the amount of effort and work that it requires to make something ready for for habitation for li- livability. And as an average family, you know most people are dependent upon jobs for income. They're dependent upon grocery stores and gas stations and everything around them. And if all those things start not being there, the preparations that they would have had to have gone to to create a sustainable. Uh, living situation for their family is is fairly heroic on the individual level. I mean, it's most people, it's quite, it's quite daunting. It's quite intimidating for most. Well, it really is. And of course, you're only going to make it so far in your own home. Uh, you may be pretty ready in a bunker if you're spending a lot of money. Uh, but the advantage that I have in my program is it's being used every day to actively farm. I put in two acres more of gardens while I was there the past week and have crops in. And so when I show up within this next year, I'll show up to 120 feet of tilapia tanks that are making fish and rabbit cages that are full of rabbits. I'm not gonna show up and get to work. I'm already at work. It's just a matter that I've decided to arrive at an operation that already has another purpose of generating food and economy to the people in my community. And this gets back to the idea that, that you're leveraging the benefic- the, the mutually beneficial um, relationship with people who are there working these farm fields or garden fields, working the fish tanks, working with everything in your, in your absence, but it's creating opportunities for them. It's, it's improving the, their current uh, lifestyle and it's, it's improving their future uh, survivability as well. So you're not narrowing your whole world down to just yourself. It doesn't all fall on your shoulders because you've broadened the opportunity base to, to benefit others. It also takes a lot of that uh, solitary load off your shoulders and, and leverages that those relationships as well. Absolutely. You know, there have been a million people who have said over the years that if everybody on earth simply adopted a family in the third world and cared about them, we'd solve most of the problems on earth. The answer to that is not so simple because how do you help that one family? It's not going to work. You're going to send them money and they're going to waste it. They need to be educated and they need to be changed in the way they see the world. You know, the Haitians I work with today would not have been able to do with me eight years ago what they do now. They've learned a lot about themselves. They've learned work ethic. They've learned honesty. They've learned to show up at work in the morning and not whenever they get around to it. They've learned new skills. That takes time to build all of those things. But the neat thing is, is that the readiness to walk into the compound comes from the fact that the primary purpose of the compound is not safely home. The primary purpose of the compound is to do the right thing in the world. And it just turns out to be safe. I think that the next thing to talk about is the duration of survivability okay. in Um, in any project. When you go in your basement, if your basement's full, you're probably done in six months. You know, your water supply probably isn't going to make it six months if they cut off the city tap and you're going to be out going outside hoping it rains, right? Um, In a bunker, it may even be shorter. You may be in a tighter environment with less room and less opportunity to collect. I have 50,000 gallons of water sitting in roof tanks right now that filled automatically from solar yesterday and stay filled on their own. 
and um, you know the vegetables are coming up and the the there is no end. My challenges are things like making sure the Haitians understand to save the best plants and let them go to seed so that I'm doing my own seed saving with non-hybrid products um, and expanding my territory going, hey, you know, we, we did this and we made it and we're all okay and we have food and we have water and we have security. Now can we add pasture? Now can we add economic opportunities? We need to, in the environment that things have fallen apart, someone needs to show the leadership, not just to rebuild their community, but to rebuild their country. You know, um, I've had the Minister of Agriculture for all of Haiti on my farm every other trip. The assistant to the president of Haiti came and visited me last year and spent four hours. These men have been on my property. One of the things that I explained to them is that one of the reasons I'm building out of 40 foot shipping containers and then welding them in, in circles is I'm earthquake proof and hurricane proof. No hurricane is gonna come and pick up 27 shipping containers even though they're empty. And they are by themselves, they're a risk in a hurricane. Mm -hmm. But welded together in great big platforms, no hurricanes picking them up. What if I hear on the internet that a class five Katrina is coming at me? I can go take everyone in my community, shove them inside containers and inside the conference center. I may lose my roof, but no one will die. I can go get all of my animals and put them in the two circular compounds that are outside and let them hunker down and they'll do the Noah's Ark thing and be nice to each other in a crisis, which animals do. And when we come out and every house in the Savanette is knocked flat from 200 mile an hour winds, everyone will be alive. And we all have to start over. Welcome to disaster. But we'll still have more solar panels to pull out. The wells will be in the ground. You pump the water and you go, well, that hurt, but that's okay. Get out more drip irrigation. Let's start over again, you know. And the first thing you have to do is you have to be in a place that you can always know you'll always be able to go on and that you won't run out of the basic supplies. And as I tell people all the time, the Haitians have been living in a Savonette for 500 years with none of my technology and they're still there. Now, I don't think they're living very well, but they're not gone. This is a survivable environment. So, I know we've had, uh, we talked to Jerry Robinson, who's an author of a book called The Bankruptcy of Our Nation, and he talked about the wisdom of his father mentioned to him of living more than one tank of gas away from a major metropolitan area because the people who are the most vulnerable, really, to not having any sustainable source of uh, food, water, that sort of thing, are those who are in the most dense urban areas. Absolutely. And um, in your case, uh, Haiti is... It, on average, much less populous, but but there are there are uh, poor, hungry, clever human beings there who would be desperate if 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 their systems that they're depending on, even for their standard of living, fall apart. So you've talked about the the alliance and the, the mutual relationship you've built with the local communities around you. Um, do you what is your thought process as kind of a worst case scenario if you did have a lot of people wandering out of Port-au-Prince, uh, desperate? I mean. When, if if the government folks there know that you know you've there's this American there who's got this really better standard of living over there, isn't that going to be a magnet for people who are desperate? I think it is. I'm not going to be alone. Remember, there are ten thousand short-term missionaries in Haiti who have compounds. Uh, most of them aren't as well equipped as I am. I don't know if any of them are because nobody's come at it from my angle but they're all capable of surviving and they'll all be in that situation. And they've all developed the same relationship with their community. Um, the people, we had a war with rebels in our country until 2004. Um, and it finally ended because the Haitian people got tired of it. And one night, every Haitian stood up with a machete and walked up to a rebel and knocked his head off. And overnight, there weren't any rebels. There weren't any elections, there weren't any police actions, no decisions were made. It was like the country said, this is killing us, we can't stand a war. And the rebels weren't that great in number. I think that's the response you would see. Haitians are intrinsically very good people and peace loving. I would simply explain to my people, there's one road in and out of our community, let's go get the backhoe and let's cut it. 
Now let's put up watch stations on the back walkways so that nobody's coming in on bikes or, or motos, as we call them in Haiti, and, um, and stop everybody. People who don't want to be stopped, bring them to me. If you want to understand what the end of a really ugly environment would look like, read Larry Niven's Lucifer's Hammer. A great story in which a asteroid hits the earth in the Gulf of Mexico and California breaks off in the United States and the United States falls into the sea. And it's the story of what happens in California. Also, Malaville, the famous 1953 book of end nuclear holocaust and a group of people who happen to be in a cave and come out to find themselves alone. Two wonderful books that walk you through the process of how ugly can this get? What bad decisions early on will I make? You know, in Malaville, it was shooting up all your ammo on day two and realizing that you could just die for that ammo in a year. Okay. And that was one of the big mistakes they made is that they just were, you know, today's the day. No, tomorrow is the day. You're always going, this may be the last of this I ever have. And you have to think that way. Right. That's the flip side of the sustainability part. There are some things that aren't so easy to, to recreate, and those things have to be, has to be prized. And, and That's the reason why one of my next investments is a 40-foot container full of rebar and cement. I got all the sand and stone I need. And water. And water. Yeah. Okay. But I do not have rebar, and I do not have cement. And I intend to stockpile it. Your thought process about long-term sustainability uh, led you also to look at power. You mentioned uh, your clean water wells that you were fortunate to be able to, and that's a key. Uh, and anyone feature. can do that. If if you go out and buy a $2,500 Grundfos pump, but German, and you go out and buy 12 first solar solar panels, 70, they, they say 70 watts, but actually they, they rank in at about 82. Um, and you tie them directly slaved, no inversion, no nothing, DC straight to the well. I can draw 16 gallons a minute from 200 feet. Okay, that's going to get you water any place on earth. You throw in good boreline hose so you can maintain that pump and a cable on it. Um, and you have a system for about $7,000 that is going to give you clean water the rest of your life without the city municipality. And that same solar system is capable of being inverted over. We're running our entire compound right now on eight Royal batteries. And I mean standard deep cycle, not the great big 300 pound things. We're running the entire compound and running at 50% capacity. By the time we get up in the morning, we're running fans, lights, pumping water up into containers. People would be surprised at how effective solar inversion really is, especially if throughout the day you use the power the sun makes and store it. Most of the panels use more than they need. If I take that same Grundfos pump, and hook it up to a 6,500 watt 110 source, which it will do intelligently without anything other than, than a knife switch. <clears throat> Boom, I am 160 gallons a minute. That's a bunch of water. That's a lot of irrigation. And so, you know, that's really how you learn to look at things. You know, you, your water is your electricity, is your power. But you know, we also have to look at things that aren't, I'm, I'm growing moringa. The moringa bean is the food, is the object in the world that is the closest to making diesel out of a plant. I've got four Lister generators that are 6,500 watt, 12 horsepower, single longer, you know, turn of the last century, 1900, protege of diesel generators. And they'll run on lipstick, okay? Yeah. And I can run my moringa seeds through cheesecloth and cut it five to one with gasoline and run my generators on stuff I grow on my own farm. Those containers are very dark in the back. You take a Pepsi bottle, put a teaspoon of bleach, fill them full of water, put a four inch hole saw in the wall of a container and shove it through a wall of a container and you have 55 watts in the back of a container during the day when you can't see your hand in front of your face in that container. There are a lot of things that we can do that keep 
the utilization down. The last of my, this last trip, I went three days, never fired a generator, and we were doing construction. We ran table saws, everything but welders. I can't weld off of inversion and risk putting a surge into the inverter. I'll run a generator for that right now. But I can run any of my equipment, including my machine shop, off of my inverter. It's a, you know, anybody can do this. This is not that big of an investment. There, the Amish have perfected solar. There are companies out there, and we can put them up on your site for people to look at, that, and they will come into your home and install a solar inverted system, and then, you know, you turn around and figure out where you want to store some water, and you've got, you can get a pretty nice standby. Some more criteria that you used in your analysis. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, talking about uh, the purpose of this isn't just uh, stuff that's just on mothballs. When it's not in use, when it's not being used for emergency purposes, you mentioned it's still a living, thriving community. That's right. Yeah, I, you know, one of the problems with, uh, it's the advantage of your home. If you decide you're going to hunker down in your home, that's nice. You're already using your home. A bunker, by definition, is intended not to be used. Nobody's going to go there on vacation for two weeks, right? Okay. And so we have the advantage that ours is a mission and it just happens to be safely home. Okay. And so, you know, that concept of dual purpose, you know, really, really helps from that perspective. Um, you know, one of the things too that you have to look at where you're at is I was approached by a group that wanted to, um, my wife and I to join them because I'm an old ER doc. I know how to do surgery. I could take your appendix out if you, if you needed to. You wouldn't want me to. We have a surgeon do it, but if you need it, I can do it, okay? I do some pretty amazing surgery in Haiti sometimes. And my wife is a psychologist and a school teacher, and these people profiled us, and they came to us and said, would you like to, to join us? And they wanted a quarter of a million dollar entry fee. And I looked up at the guy, and I said, quit talking to me. You don't want to give me information that you don't need me to know. You guys are very secretive. I'm not secretive, okay? And um, I said, so quit talking to me. Uh, I'm not doing it. And he went, boy, I can't believe you're turning this down, Doc. And I went, I'm all set up. And he went, oh my gosh, Haiti. And I said, look, you're going to have a bunker someplace in North Dakota. And you're going to come out in May. And the permafrost is going to start to thaw. And maybe you can get some tomatoes and some potatoes to come up before the first frost in the fall. And you're going to spend every day in a 55 degree room with two coats on cold and damp. And I said, and I'm going to be sipping a, sipping a mint julep sitting under a palm tree and talking to my friends. I said, seasonal availability is a big key. The people who will survive in a very difficult time are going to be south of Tennessee and down to the equator. And the people who are north of that had better have some kind of a winter plan. Now, if you've got a big wood lot and a lot of wood and you like chopping wood, obviously we all know that we did that through the past 500 years in this country in French and Indian War. But I don't want to live like that. I don't want to spend all my time chopping wood to stay warm. And you also talk about uh, the economic function of your opportunities that you provide. I mean, you, you've got so many threads of activity going on there, and there's always, it seems to be, multiple purposes involved. There's, there's this, the sustainability, uh, life-supportive uh, uh, purpose of what's going on. There's the educational and training purpose of what's going on. And then there's an the economic purpose of what's going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Make get, money. Everybody needs to be able eventually to make money because eventually you need things that you have to trade or buy. And, you know, we live uh, two miles north of the largest rice field in the Caribbean. I will never need for food, okay? I'll always be okay. Um, I can get all the oil I need from the palms and the coconuts that grow all around me. I have excellent oil supplies. I'm growing rabbit and, and you know, we'll have all the fish I need and goat and etc. But the key is, is that we have to get to the point where the people who live in our community have a part-time job that they too can make money. We don't want them to envy our dollar bills. 
right? We want them also to be making their own living so that they see us as something to protect because we're their lifeblood. And, you know, so we're, we are in the middle of manufacturing a machine that is going to let us make floating fish pellets. There are 17 tilapia manufacturers, growers in Haiti. There should be more. This is a great thing to do in the tropics. We want to teach people how to do tilapia aquaponics, which is our school. And then we want to make non-GMO floating fish pellets and sell them. The beauty being that the people who live in the community can grow the cassava and the moringa and the sorghum that goes in those pellets to feed those fish. And now everybody in the community can grow a drought resistant crop that I can sell outside my community. Uh, we want to put together a welding school, but all welding schools weld. Nobody in Haiti knows how to do specialty metals. We want to get TIG 4000s in there and get to the point where we can maintain equipment that no one else can fix. Uh, we're very interested in solar technology, um, education, and local production. The kind of solar equipment that's needed in the tropics is different than what you need in America because everything is made to be bolted to an air-conditioned wall. Our stuff is commonly on a wall that's 120 degrees and it burns out. We're learning that. We're figuring out how to do that. Uh, that's something we could turn into a business. And we're going to make a solar ice house. And then we raise rabbit. We raise tilapia. We package it. We freeze it take it to the Dominican Republic and sell it for twice what we can sell it for in Haiti. You know, you just have bamboo, growing bamboo. This is the most important scaffolding material, furniture material, flooring material. Uh, I can make hydraulic pipe out of it. I can make musical instruments out of it. There's no end to what I can do with bamboo. We have hundreds of plants growing down there now on drip irrigation that are going to explode this year, and they make shade. One of the reasons that a lot of people who are currently uh, embedded in the modern paradigm in urban and suburban settings don't leave, the reason that they feel like they can only go to the Caribbean on vacation, for example, is that's their, their, their job. Their career seems to be tied to this modern world. But you found a way to leverage your big city schooling and, and, and bring value into that a community through that, and you've found ways, avenues for other people who have other skills to also uh, be able to, to deliver those services or whatever in, in that alternate setting as well. If you can just kind of, what's the range of examples of, of things like that that you see transportable into that uh, environment? I mean, Oh, it's infinite. I, I have 50 of them. One of the most interesting ones is I'm working with an organization out of Germany called Anamed. And I grow a plant called Artemisia, which uh, is the only known treatment for multiply drug-resistant malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. World Health Organization is furious about this plant because none of their drugs work and they don't want to see an herbal succeed. Um, and uh, I can turn that into a cash plant to treat malaria throughout the Caribbean in a heartbeat and be, you know, the supplier. Um, and we have greatly improved that, that productivity and are finding other uses for it. Uh, that organization, Onimed, has 49 other plants that are all pharmacologically active products. One of the things we're all going to miss when the world takes one giant step backwards is going to be pharmacology. Pharmacy's gone, yeah. Yeah, pharmacy's gone. You won't be a bear aspirin, but you do have a willow tree or you do have a wild cherry tree for your salicylates, if you're smart enough to know that. We want to grow those and more things. I'm learning about Venus flytraps right now, an incredible natural antibiotic. You hear it advertised on AM radio. It's true, okay? And, and my artemisia is a natural antibiotic. And so uh, we want to make a pellet processing facility so that we can press herbal tablets and become the, um, um, what do we call it, the industrial pharmacy industry in the Caribbean because we are the only people who have any medicine. And some of these things would be relatively simple. I mean, you know, you can make an aspirin pill in a bathtub. You know, it's not hard to get the salicylates out of willow. I got to tell you, I don't know what tropical plant has salicylates in it, but give me another year, I'll figure it out. 
and you know, et cetera. And that's the key. The key is to have that ability to say, okay, look, we learned a lot over the last 200 years in pharmacology, and we now have learned a lot about herbal medicine, which is what I specialize in. How do I bring that knowledge together with a pellet processing plant and make pills. There are a million of these. You, you know, every time I do this thing where I take everything that I have in my mind and I put it on the abscissa and the mantissa of a massive chart, and then I go put the two items together and go, how do those two items go together? Got nothing. Sometimes you look at it and go, got nothing. And sometimes you go, oh my gosh, I never thought about that. We combinations. Make, combinations. What are my assets? Am I thinking about all of those combinations of assets? Yeah. And when you do that, really smart people, and I'm surrounded by them, I've got some really great people, uh, you know, that are on our team, uh, just come back with tremendous ideas, like Aaron did with the permaculture. Just changed my entire world in one sense. It makes sense. me think that other members of the uh, Reluctant Preppers viewing community that have specialized skills that have proven themselves out in the modern world uh, might be curious about... Uh, exploring with you how those skills might uh, transport or translate into uh, adding value in, in such an environment. I want to talk to them. I want to meet those people who look at what I'm doing and say that that makes a lot of sense to me. I want to participate. We have the room. I, I have infinite room. I mean, it's miles to my next non neighbor. I mean, I have 1500 people who are my neighbors. They'll all willingly rent or sell land to me. And, uh, and we can keep expanding until we contain as many people as possible. As long as each person who comes creates a wider base of stability to the community. Right now, I'm really short on teaching. One of the things that I really realize is that I don't have the people to teach my grandchildren uh, what they need to know. Right now, I haven't done the work to develop a paper-based, because I don't trust electronics to survive, okay? EP pulsing could be a huge issue. Ha simply not having a working net could be an issue. I got a question whether or not you want to be pointing a radar dish in the sky so people know where you are, okay? I think you want to be on ham radio with no microphone and listening. I think that's about the level of technology I'm going to be at. But I don't have anybody who's built my school system. We need to be collecting all the textbooks. One of the great characters in uh, the, the, the book, Lucifer's Hammer by Larry Niven, is a geeky, four-eyed guy who collected the 5,000 greatest books in the world containing knowledge you'd need if the world ever fell apart wrapped them in aluminum foil, wrapped them in saran wrap, dipped them in wax, and filled a cistern with them and sealed it. And then when they were interviewing people on the mountain to say, do you get to come in? How much value do you bring to our community? He showed up with the 1953 S USDA edition of M.G. Kane's Independence on Five Acres and the book How Things Work and said, I have 4,998 more of those and handed them to Senator Jensen. And he said, you're in. You know, you, you gotta bring what's yeah, valuable. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power, but so is accumulation. The uh, early 20th century writer G.K. Chesterton was asked the, the, the stumper question, if you were stranded on a desert island what and only had one book with you, what book would you bring? And people were expecting him to say the, the Bible or something really profound. He said, uh, the practical guide to shipbuilding. <laughs> exactly. For those of our viewers who really s sincerely do want to talk with you more about whether their plans for the future might align with uh, your visions for uh, Safely Home, how, how can they find out more? Uh, just send me an email, uh, jay at wellnessrx.org. And send me your address and I'll send you a package. I have a, a DVD with a small printout that contains hundreds. One of the things I put on the DVD is hundreds of practical EDN notes about development and about how you raise bamboo and how do you do vermiculture, et cetera. And I think people will just enjoy seeing what the level of technical knowledge there is that's available out there and I wanna disseminate it. And so, um, you know, if people are really interested, you know, send me a request. 
um, and I'll send you a package. I'm very interested in meeting people who would like to come down and join us. I guess to wrap it up, if you could just focus, bring it right up to the, the point of stewardship, because you talked about this all starting from a purpose and really come back to what is that, that driving purpose that really propels you forward on this. There's more than well, just more when than I just showed up, When I showed up in the Savannah in 2005, it was 100% voodoo. We had one church in the community and it had about 20 members. And today, half of my community would call themselves nominal Christians, and there's probably 250 people in church every Sunday morning. And uh, we have not really evangelized a community. Uh, I think it was St. Francis who said, uh, uh, preach the word at all times when necessary, use words. And we live by that. We pretty much are what we say. We don't make promises we don't keep. And we meet all these people on their level and they truly are my friends. I, I love my people in Haiti desperately. And so if we go out and we really create an environment of love in the world, a lot of good things will flow from that. God has been very good to me in this project and I think it's because we've genuinely been trying to do his work. Well, I think we're gonna leave it with that and Dr. Nielsen, off-grid expert and uh, founder and a head of Safely Home Haiti, Thank you for being with us here on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you very much. It was fun as always.